Okay, so we have a busy schedule, so maybe we can slowly start. So welcome to the, the second half of today's talks on the Xenon XS. And um, let's start directly with, uh, with Yuri. Uh, just uh, a reminder, I will tell you maybe two minutes before the end, uh, just to remind you uh, when the minutes more or less uh, are gone. So please, Yuri. Thank you, Luca. All right, it's great to be here. And uh, let's jump right in. A um, few months back, in fact, John and I were thinking, John Beekham and I were thinking about dark matter production mechanisms. And you all know the WIMP production and probably also know what is the SIMP production mechanism where number changing interactions lead to strongly interacting uh, dark matter particles. And we were considering a variant of that number changing process where also a standard model particle is involved um, in the reaction that at the same time um, uh, stops the overheating of the dark sector because the rest mass is converted to kinetic energy if if we had not and if we had no connection to the standard model the dark soup would just overheat and structure formation would be affected so we're looking at this combined process where we have standard model and dark particles um, playing together and the freeze out of this process gives you uh, interaction rate that um, essentially links the rate and the dark matter mass since we have the requirement of the relic abundance um, to be what it is today. Now we all, you all know how it works for the WIMP. We have also the interaction rate and the mass of the dark matter particles. So for the WIMP, the thermal relic line is essentially constant in, in the mass space. Below that line, if the interaction is lower, we have too much dark matter above, we don't have enough. And on the line, it's just right. So unitarity constraints uh, the cross section to be smaller than a certain value at large masses. And then we also have experiments that test this parameter space. So far for the WIMP scenario. In the COSIMP um, regime or in this model um, or framework, if you have this kind of effective interaction, the uh, relation is different. So the interaction rate is not a constant, but a function of the mass because we have a different dependence on number densities of initial state particles on the interaction. There's also a kinematic uh, condition that the cosmic particle has to be tw uh, lighter than two of standard model particles it happens to in order to avoid a WIMP-like annihilation where you have two standard model, model particles in the final state. Now if we couple this um, particle to electrons, let's call it electrophilic, uh, electrophilic scenario, then we expect um, signals in um, detectors that can see electronic recoils. So we used that uh, in February back um, then, Xenon only had this data out for their double electron capture searches and we used this data to place first constraints on that model. And for example, if we had a 250 kV crossing and it would interact with electrons, then uh, the rest mass of the one of these particles which are consumed when they meet the electron is um, used to give a kick to the standard model particle, the electron and the cosump, and the result is a monoenergetic line if we neglect the initial velocities of the particle. So if we have a 250 candidate, um, dark matter candidate, we would have a, around 100 kV recoils. And now the situation has changed in the sense that Xenon has released new data um, at low energies, essentially below the 30 kV, there's a new data release as we know. And now if we look at those um, spectra here, there, there is an axis. And if we assume that the mass of the cosm is lighter than in this example, roughly 45 kV, and it has this kind of um, interaction rate, then we can fit the axis quite well. And there are actually secondary features because now we also took into account the initial velocities of different uh, electrons of the orbits on the xenonaut. So since they can have also initial velocities which are non-negligible, that adds more spread to the feature. Okay, now there is an interesting observation, namely that if we uh, link via the thermal production uh, the mass to the interaction rate, since we know what the abundance of dark matter is today. And then we take the xenon one plan experiment, take its mass and exposure time and demand that we would see 50 events in there. That gives us an interaction rate that is pointing towards a mass between 30 and 50 kV. 
And given the kinematics of this reaction, that uh, gives us recoils between two and six keV, which is exactly uh, where this uh, excess lies in the xenon one ton. So that's interesting because uh, now the mass is not completely independent, as in the case, for example, of a arbitrary alt axon like particle where we can fit the axis with any mass. Uh, so I would call that the look right here effect. So I think it's an interesting observation in that sense. Now, what are the implications of this kind of scenario if we assume that this uh, model reproduces the data of the zero one one experiment? This would be the red star in the parameter space, which lies pretty much on the relic abundance line where we have the correct relic abundance of dark matter. And um, there we can take this interaction and close it to uh, have a two loop interaction which induces elastic scattering of the um, particles with electrons and those uh, elastic interactions have a predicted cross section and however the energy release is very low right because we have a very light dark matter candidate this elastic scattering would have energy deposits below the LED scale and this is not visible in any current experiments yet however there are a bunch of experiments based on new materials or superconducting superconductor techniques that will actually probe these much smaller energy gaps and will be able to probe this parameter region. So that is an interesting application where we could actually test this hypothesis in a completely different channel. Now what are further consequences except for the um, new low energy elastic uh, depo uh, energy deposits in those new detectors? We'll also ex expect a signal in detectors that look for electronic recalls with argon. And there the signal shape should be slightly different because we have different shells in argon compared to xenon and different velocity distributions of, initial, of the initial electrons. And then we could do a comparison of the shapes if argon, the base detectors would also see something like that. So there's interesting potential in this direction. Then there's also the um, assumption that the neutrino sector is actually richer than it appears to be that in order to be consistent with uh, BBN observations, we would require the temperature of the neutrino bath to be 10% lower than the standard model. So that might uh, indicate that there's something else going on in the neutrino sector, which is an interesting consequence if that observation would be confirmed. Now, um, also new collider signatures could be expected. However, that is a question for a UV complete model. We have looked at an effective interaction, non-normalizable non operator, but uh, it would be cool to have a UV completion where, for example, we could study processes where the cosimp collides with an electron and produces two cosimps, where the energy essentially of the collision is above the mass of the cosimp and the, also above the cutoff of the theory. Um, however, yes, if we had essentially a UV complete theory, we could study in detail how such a shower would look like. And that is something very interesting to consider for the tech, uh, for lighter signatures. Also, the opacity of materials is a question which could be addressed in a similar way, essentially, like if a high energy cosm hits a material, how does it move in this material will also be described by such a shower process if the energy is high. Then the exact computations of loop coefficients definitely also depends on possible UV completions. And that's why we are looking with Beizhou and John Beacom at OSU in possible UV completions of that model. And that would be very interesting to try to solve and answer those questions. So about two minutes. Oh, perfect. Excellent, okay. excellent. So in summary, uh, there is like a new thermal dark matter production mechanism that we proposed and it can be directly tested in the lab. The interaction is exactly one which can be accessed in the direct detection experiment and it's consistent actually with a xenon one ton excess, which is exciting. And um, well, one has also other parameters which one can check, for example, the low threshold detectors that could look for elastic interactions and also astrophysical probes and colliders and other things where we could further investigate this scenario. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, I see a question from Yure. So please, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask. Hi, Yuri. Uh, nice Hi. talk. Thank so you. I think I missed, uh, you had a comment about the look, well, look elsewhere effect. Yes. Can you say again why this is not present? Oh, right. Okay. So 
I'm not sure if it's not completely present, but I'm saying that the mass is not arbitrary. If we say, okay, the xenon one ton with a, about a ton of mass and about like 0.6 years exposure sees 50 events, then by uh, this condition, I can know what the rate is and, I'm, uh, and I know what the abundance of dark matter is today. And then that tells me something about the mass interval, which I have to look for. And then the kinematics again tells me that this mass corresponds to recoils around 2.2 2 to 6 kV. And this then that points me towards this region of the, um, of the data set. That's why I'm saying okay. it's not an arbitrary mass. Okay, thanks. Sure, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, are there other questions? So it seems not. Uh, uh, I suggest that uh, we move to the next speaker and uh, we thank uh, um, we thank Yuri for the nice talk. Yeah. Ah, there's, oh, okay. So next speaker is uh, Marco Fedele. We talk about uh, solar actions and astrophysics. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks for the invitation. So let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the proposed interpretation of the anomaly by the Xenon collaboration as a hint of uh, solar actions. So in here, uh, I will focus mainly on the interaction between actions and either photon or electron, which is described by this Lagrangian. I'm not concerned about the interaction with nucleons because it's responsible of the Primakov effect, which is far away from the uh, excess, so we're not gonna be interested about it. On the other hand, the coupling with the photon is the one that uh, introduces the Primakov emission, which is this bump in here, close to the axis, and the coupling with the electron is responsible of the ABC emission, which is right on top of the uh, anomaly. So those are the two couplings I'm gonna be focusing on. So, in details, this is the number of actions emitted by unity of uh, uh, time and energy for the action. So as I said, the Primakov kicks in uh, when the photon is coupled to the action, and in particular when a photon interacts with an external electric field and emits an action. For the ABC, we will focus mainly on the B and the C components of the emission, which are the Bremsstrahlung and the Compton emissions, for which we have nice analytical approximation. Concerning the A component, which relates to the atomic recombination and the excitation, we will not get into the details for this talk. So here I'm going to show you a map of, uh, let's say a plot of density versus temperature for a set of stars. So starting from the sun, which is here, which is the one that would be responsible of this uh, axion observed by Xenon. But of course, if, if axions are produced by the sun, they will be also produced by other stars, like white dwarfs or the one in the red giant branch or the horizontal branch of a globular cluster. So in here, I'm giving contours of the axion energy loss rates per unit of mass, and they're assuming here a coupling to the electrons uh, normalized to the 10 to the minus 13 to be order 4.3. Now, as a comparison, the xenon 1T uh, interpretation would suggest this coupling to be order 30. So quite bigger. Now this plot is accurate for a pure helium plasma star, while for stars like the sun or the one in the main sequence, which have a hydrogen core, their position is only approximate and biased towards larger rate. Now if one compares the sun to, for instance, the white dwarfs, we will get that the Compton emission is taking this bias into account, mainly similar, while the white dwarfs will have a larger Bremsstrahlung component. On the other hand, both the stars in the red giant branch and the horizontal branch have way larger components, both in the Compton and in the Bremsstrahlung channel, which, which means that basically, if we assume a large emission from the sun, this would imply that the other stars would turn into action by houses. So let's take a further look about how the action are produced in those stars. So the stars by the RG branch, which is characterized by stars with a degenerate helium core and a burning hydrogen shell around it. So during the evolution, this hydrogen burns, so it produces an increase of the core of the helium core, and the luminosity of the stars grows till it gets to a critical point in temperature and in density, where the luminosity gets its tip, and the helium starts to ignite, moving the stars to the horizontal branch. 
Now, if one would assume additional cooling mechanism, like for instance, uh, the present, the ones induced by axion dampstrung in the core, this would delay the helium emission, which would cause, cause mainly two consequences. The first one being the star reaching higher luminosities, and the second one, the helium core growing larger in mass. Now we have a measurement of the magnitude of this peak on the M5 cluster. And here we have a theoretical parameterization of the relation between this magnitude and the coupling between axion and electron. Now it's worth to mention that this is just an analytical fit to 10 evolutionary points, the highest of which being with the GA13 of order 9. And I recall you that the one suggested by Xeno should be of order 30. So the use of this formula for values so high in GA13 might be, let's say, taken with a bit of grain of salt. Now moving to the horizontal branch, those have now a burning helium core, and the balance in the star is basically between the thermal pressure and the gravitational pull, which means that the larger the pull is, the faster the star has to burn. Once the fuel is exhausted, it will basically collapse into a white dwarf. Now, if we announce the burning rate due to the Primakov, or for instance, we have a heavier core due to a longer phase in the rejoining branch, this would imply that the horizontal branch lifetime is reduced. And so if one defines the year parameter as the number of stars in the horizontal branch over the number of the ones in the Rejoian branch, this value, which has been measured on average over 39 cluster, would decrease due to the reduced lifetime of the horizontal branch stars. Once again, we have an extra uh, theoretical formula for this parameter, which relies also on the RGB ones. So for similar reasons, this should be taken with a bit of grain of salt for values of G13 above 9. However, this, the shape of this function is quite nice, so it can be maybe feasible to extrapolate it for higher values. And one observes that once G13 gets around 14 or 15, so already still below the values suggested by xeno one t this value will approach zero for values of the coupling, again, in order of units of 10 to the minus 10 with the photon of order 1. Now let's move to the last class of stars we're going to talk about, which are the white dwarfs. Now, the white dwarfs have two components that are of interest in this game. The first one is the fact that there are some pulsating white dwarfs, also known as white dwarf variables, which have their luminosity varying periodically, whose period is proportional to the temperature of the star. It's also important to see that if one plots the number distribution of white dwarfs in function of their luminosity, and this is called the white dwarf luminosity function, this plot, this shape of this plot, is affected by the velocity of the evolution of the white dwarfs. So if one would add extra coolant sources, like the one induced by action emission, it would have on one side the variation of this period change, and on the other, a faster evolution of the stars, resulting in the change of the shape of the white dwarf luminosity function. Now, once again, we have experimental measurements, in particular for four different pulsating white dwarfs which are nicely described by this formula. And from the light function shape, we can directly extract a bound on the coupling to electrons. OK, so let's put everything together now. So in this plot, I'm going to show in gray the two sigma bounds for the four separate astrophysical observables. In red, there is the combined hint when we do a global fit with all this together. While on the right, in blue, we have the band suggested by the xeno one t interpretation as an effect of solar actions. We also report in green updated cast exclusions. And it's also interesting to notice that this exclusion is dependent on the mass of the axions. So if the mass is kind of too heavy, so let's say above the electron volt, these limits are no longer applicable because they go way higher. And we also report the exclusion coming from solar data. And it's worth to mention that those bands are updated compared to the ones originally showed by the xenon 1T collaboration. Now, their band can be parameterized by means of this relation, with G bar is distributed at one sigma in this range, capable to reproduce this 90% confidence level. So basically, what we want to do is to address, in a quantitative way, the tension between the stars and the xenon 1T interpretation. So how do we do it? We assume for G E and G gamma to follow this relation, and we see what this would imply for the astrophysical observable. 
So, so here's the table. Minutes. Yes. Here's a table between uh, where we compare the experimental value with the prediction, and where also we give uh, the tension in sigma between those two values. So concerning the white dwarfs, we see that the tension is between 3 and 5 sigma. So it's already starting to be interesting. But for the tip of the RGB, and more importantly for the R parameter, we range from 5 till up to 19 sigma. Now, as I said, for these two observables, we have this uh, theoretical approximation that might not be, let's say, trustworthy above 9 for G13. So what we report here is indeed the upper bound that we get on these values, if one assumes indeed the limit value of G13 equal to 9. For instance, for R, where we said that the parameterization is quite smooth, if one goes on and gets still the value such that R would get to zero, and we're still below the one required by the casino one t we would get up to a 46 sigma tension. But again, this could be a bit, maybe a bit reckless. So let's stick with the conservative upper bounds. So before concluding our addendum, in the last few days, it has been pointed out that the inverse Primakov effect might help to reduce the tension between the solar action and the astrophysical observable. Way is going to talk about this right after me, and there was another paper on the archive this morning. And the Xenon Wente collaboration is indeed currently investigating whether this effect is as promising as it seems from these few papers. However, what's important to notice is that if one takes into account this effect, we will get lower allowed values for the cutting with the electron, which will result in removing the tension with white dwarf and the red giant branches. But however, the value for the cutting with the, with the photon will still be so high that in the air parameter, we will still get an eight sigma tension. Hence, this would still rule out the interpretation as QCD solar actions being the only reason behind the excess for the Xenos 1T. So concluding, we all agree that this uh, access anyway is extremely interesting, and we are looking forward to rule out, uh, hopefully, the tritium background hypothesis in the first few months of Xenon NT program. However, we show that uh, even in a conservative approach, uh, the, the signal cannot be interpreted as being origin of solely by solar actions, since uh, it's extremely at stake with data coming from astrophysics. And it's also important to stress that similar new physics explanation based on solar production of light particles or on the non, the non modification of the neutrino properties are also prone to these severe astrophysical constraints and are similarly possible. Thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Um, so there's time for questions. No, I didn't want to stop the share. I'm sorry. Okay. So I see a raise hand from, from Jure, but I guess it's the previous one. Sorry. No, it's okay. So, if there are no questions, I see nothing in the chat. Okay, so I guess we, we move to the next talk since we have many today. And uh, we okay. thank you again, thank uh, you. Marco, for the nice talk. Thank you. So the next speaker, is uh, Wake Sue that uh, we talk about a uh, similar uh, subject. So I, I leave the, the stage to Wei, please. Okay, you can see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, so, thanks. thanks for having me. Thanks for Marco's talk. And I will continue the solar axon explanation. Here I focus on the, the previous neglected channel with inverse Primakov process. And basically, is axon convert to photon in the in the xenon detector. This work is done with my collaborator Christina Gao, Liu Jia, Lian Tao Wan, Xiaoping, and Yimin. Let's get started. Here's the the summary slides and the xenon one to access and the solar axons. And we know that we know that there's the electron required access around the one to five keV from the xenon one to uh, collaboration. Uh, this is can be explained by many. Uh, many scenario. The solar axon is a very natural one. It's because the, the temperature of the of the sun is like KeV. They give you if you have axon, you can they can give you the uh, KeV axon. It doesn't depend on the axon uh, 
uh, whether axon is dark matter or not, it doesn't depend on axon mass. If the axon is smaller than kV, it's okay. And the flux of the solar axon is super large. It's like 10 to the 10 per centimeter square uh, per, per second compared to the normal dark matter annihilation or dark matter decay is much larger. Uh, then the axon will pro produce in the sun, I will, I will give you in more detail later, and then they will detect in the xenon. It's, the xenon collaboration talking, uh, is discussed the axon absorbed by electron. And here, I, the, the point I, in my paper and in my talk is, is easy, the axon will, will convert to the photon in the xenon detector. Okay, just some, the production. And the production is, uh, here I focus on the, as before we, as the Marcus talk, we focus on two operator. One is the axon coupled to the uh, E bar gamma mu gamma five E, and the axon the other is axon coupled to photon F mu F mu prime. And in the in the in the sun, they have two process. Uh, actually, one one is the ABC process. One one represent the example that's coming from the electron scattering ion breast charging uh, axon. The typical energy is like uh, one to two keV. So you see the flux is proportional to GAE square. The other is a chromatical uh, process. It's got the photon, the thermal photon in the in the sun scattering with the electron or ion. They will produce the axon. Axon, axon has a weak interaction with sun. They will they will they will travel uh, travel from sun to the earth. Then then they can travel to the earth. They travel to the xenon detector. And uh, there is one operator. They can is the GAE operator I mentioned. This KeV axon can be absorbed by the by the electron in the xenon. Then you will see that uh, if it's coming from the uh, ABC, ABC process, you will proportional GAE to the force because the production and detection for the primary uh, process, you will, will proportional the GA gamma square and the GAE square. Then if you make GAE uh, go to zero, then the detector rate goes to zero. So this this boils down to this 2D map given by the xenon one tone collaboration. The GA gamma versus the GAE, the blue region, is can explain the xenon uh, xenon one tone axis. Let's focus on the, the the one I highlight in the in the left corner. And you just say that your GAE goes to zero, you because your detection rate goes smaller, you, you should make the GA gamma much larger to explain the excess. Go to 10 to the minus eight, you go to 10 to the minus seven. But it's already in tension with the, with the solar constraints. There's a, there's a cast bound, there's a cast bound, possibly depending on the mass, and also there's a stellar cooling bound you already heard from the previous talk. So there's a inverse Primakov process. This, the axon will, will travel to the detector and convert to the photon. They, because of the kinetic reason, the KEV axon will convert to the KEV photon, the KEV photon will end the xenon. Xenon can hardly distinguish the photon signal from the electron recoil. So it's the same as the electron recoil. But let's compare the two rate. One is the absorption, one is the conversion. Which rate, it, it seems like the absorption doesn't pay the price of coupling. The, the, for the conversion, let's say the primitive conversion, you have paid the price of coupling, or the cross-section paid the price of RPEF. The other thing is like, here I list the cross-section. The, the thing I want you to look at is the form factor. It's the axon has a keV energy, so W wavelength is one of the keV. The xenon, uh, then, it's have the, then you have the, the famous uh, coherent scattering effect from the dark matter direct action, they were coherent scattering with xenon. So you imagine that the, this, even is suppressed by the alpha, but they get enhanced by the charge. The charge is like if it's a proton number of the xenon, it's 54. So you, the other thing is like, but we know that xenon atom is also the size of one of kV. They have a screen effect. I put R zero here is like it represented the, the size of the uh, the xenon. Actually, they will change the z go to effective z is like uh, from the fifty four to five. But nevertheless, you can see the plot over here. You, we make the GAE go to zero, but the GA gamma is sizable ten to minus ten. Uh, they can still can can beat the the excess reasonable well. Let me. Let me compare the list, uh, uh, the same 2D plot that we made. It's like you will see the visual inverse uh, uh, primakov. You, you see the, the tendency over here, GAE goes smaller, GA gamma goes larger. But we saw the inverse prime channel at a small GAE, they were uncorrelated with GAE. Definitely, they were at least, least count two, we are not excluded by the solar, uh, uh, solar bond, but still has tension. But, uh, we release tension, but still has, has a tension with the solar cooling, like R parameter. But the, from the plot is like a factor few, and um, let's take uh, let's take the the bond. Let's if we take the astro bond seriously, let's 
we, we see we need to introduce additional physics, new physics to elevate, elevate the, the extra tension. The model we are thinking about, let's say U1B. The, the, there's a dark photon and the couple to the, the baryon charge. So you have the, the axon will couple to the F mu mu, also a couple to the F mu mu pi, and F mu mu, F mu mu pi is the, uh, is the feed stress of the U1, the, the U1 dark photon. But we needed the A prime smaller than KEV. The reason is like for the sterile cooling bond, we don't want to change it too much. If, if you go to larger value, actually the, uh, the horizontal branch and the branch star constraints can be, can be be important. The more important region is the form factor. As I told you, the effective charge for the xenon by scattering of the axon is five. Right now, because it's coupled to the U1B charge, the form factor is from uh, five to the to the atomic number 131. So it's, this is a factor of 20, and you're talking about the cross section is 20 square. And you may you may you may think about the uh, you may don't like the the anomalous the uh, U1. You can you, you can do the U1B mass L is still can elevate tension. And here also because the sun is different from, from right giant, uh, different from the horizontal branch, uh, for example, density temperature, you also can think about environment dependent on cooling rate. I will not talk in detail here, but let me, let me conclude and uh, do some discussion here. We, we think that the inverse parameter of if, uh, process cannot be neglected. This is just axon converted photon in the xenon detector, and they can release tension with the extra bond. And instead of really completely soft tension, you, you need to introduce the A prime. So in the future, we may we may to to look at the A prime signal and uh, not only from the xenon, but from other other detector or astro and the uh, and the cosmo process. The other thing is like there's other dark matter model like luminous dark matter, radiant dark matter. They can also produce the photon signal in the xenon detector. Just look at the xenon detector. How do we distinguish this signature? and between these models, this possibly the future directions. Uh, that's all I want to talk about and leave the time for the questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wei, for the interesting talk. And that's time for question. We have a question from uh, Aaron Pierce. Please, you can, uh, you can speak. Well, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I'm quite surprised they didn't already include this uh, inverse Primakov, so it's quite a nice observation. Um, I was wondering about this last model you mentioned with the, uh, the A prime. Uh, yeah. Are there are there not pretty strong uh, stellar cooling bounds from the A prime itself if you have this such a light uh, A prime? Uh, oh, you you mean they they couple couple to the couple to the U one barrier? As or yeah, B minus we, L. I think I thought there were quite strong bounds on such a particle. But it doesn't go to ten to the minus ten. I, I remember we check it. Uh, it's uh, like for KEV A prime. It's it's it didn't. It's not the uh, same as the axons. I mean, you want barrel. Yeah, that, may, maybe we, we go back. Uh, I will check it later. So I, when, I, when I do the model, I found that it's, uh, it's still survived in the, with the 10 to the minus 10 coupling one. Okay, thank you. So the other questions? Answer the questions. Maybe just a comment. Uh, I mean, due to this uh, new effect that you point out, one should also revisit the uh, the bounds and the constraints of other experiments, mm -hmm. like uh, Lux and uh, others that were attempting to detect only the axioelectric effect. Yeah, I don't think their bound can be better than seen on one tone, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much way for the next talk. And uh, if there are no other questions, we, we move to the next speaker. Yep, just one second. Can you see slides? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. perfect. So we have um, Michele Tamaro, uh, please. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. So I'll present this uh, paper uh, worked with, in collaboration with uh, Gil Patz and Alexei Petrov from Wayne State and Yura Zupan from the University of Cincinnati. So the idea it's, it's easy is to look at non-relativistic dark matter of uh, mass of order of few GV. And since it's non-relativistic dark matter, the relevant scattering is on nuclei. It's on xenonuclei. 
Now the interaction with the standard model, as a, writing in the, in, in the Lagrangian here, is through these really operators, which is basically interaction with two photons. In this case, I'm writing the uh, Lagrangian for a real scalar, uh, and we both have the CP even operator and the CP odd. Just for simplicity, we're gonna look at the first one, and then the rest of the talk. Just two comments. Uh, these operators, it's usually generated through loop of heavy states that uh, are charged on the U1 hypercharge. That's why we have the uh, loop factor here in front. And is the leading, in this case, is the leading contribution for real scalars or for uh, Majorana fermions. In, in this case, it's a dimension seven operators. While for um, Dirac fermions, there is also the magnetic moment uh, interaction with one photon is generated. But in our case of the real scalar, these operators induces a three level exchange with the nuclei in which one of the photon is exchanged with the, with the xenon and the other one is emitted. And since a low energy photons, uh, xenon one ton cannot distinguish between photons and electrons, the culprit of this excess in our model is due to this emitted photon. And indeed, if we simulate this uh, uh, event using Monte Carlo simulation with my graph. This is just an example with using a benchmark of uh, dark matter with two GV mass and a velocity is 400 kilometers per second, which is just slightly above the, the peak. We can see that the yellow region is the uh, energy spectrum of the recalling nucleus, while the blue region is the uh, energy spectrum of the photon. So most of the energy goes into the photon and for this low masses, no relativistic dark matter, the photon is the only one that is above the threshold, uh, that's this gray region. Of course, to get the feet, one has to uh, integrate over the velocity distribution that we take to be a usual Maxwell Maxwellian distribution. And we can see that once we have the, um, uh, uh, the integration over the distribution, the best fit point that describes the, the xenon excess is for a mass that it's 1.9 GV but as a very relatively light new physics scale, so a ratio of lambda over the Wilson coefficient that is around 50 MeV. In our case, we, the, our fit shows the significance over the background only hypothesis of 3.3 sigma. So once we have this best fit point, we should look at the, if we can already probe this model, especially due to the very relatively light new scale. So first of all, this new operators, induce uh, one loop spin independent scattering on nucleum, on nuclei, which is uh, described by this uh, diagram here. The problem with this uh, one loop scattering is that it's described by a non-perturbative matrix element, basically sandwiching the Rayleigh operator on, on nuclear uh, states. And one can have a naive uh, uh, estimate in which these factor, this non-perturbative factor is goes as, uh, as uh, the inverse of the average radius of the nuclei, but the factor in front is, is very uncertain. And here we show the, in, in this plot on the right, we show the, the bounds for, um, uh, for some uh, experiment that look at a light dark matter uh, scattering for two different values of this K. Like, let's say the aggressive is the dashed which we take k of 0.5, and then the solid is the more conservative, it's one order magnitude less. And you can see that depending on, on, the, on the value that we take, the model that it's in, green, in, in the green region is the one and two sigma preferred region to explain the xenon excess can either be already probed or it's slightly above the, the bounds, just uh, the, the region above this line is excluded. So the preferred region for xenon one ton can either be uh, already excluded or it's slightly above uh, the bound. And this is for um, scattering on nuclei. We also have indirect detection scattering. And to do that, we look at an example, on a, example of a model of secluded dark matter in which the interaction between the dark matter sector and the standard model is mediated by a lit light scalar. And in this case, just for simplicity, we're looking at the CP event, but one can also have the and uh, the analogous CP, CP odd. So this, uh, in this Lagrangian, we have two terms. One is, is the one that goes from the dark matter interacts with, with the scalar and then the scalar 
as the, the typical F mu F mu interaction. The, there are two processes. There are, uh, there are, there are three processes that are induced by, by this Lagrangian. One is, as you can see, uh, the first two are in this uh, Feynman diagram. There is uh, uh, emission of photon or two dark matter going to two scalar and then each scalar goes to two photon. And this can be bounded by uh, gamma ray search from the galactic center. While we can, well, the first bound is relevant, one can avoid the second bound here, but uh, assuming that then uh, the branch ratio of this scalar uh, to photon is very, is very small, but it's, uh, it's predominantly into neutrinos or invisible, or invisible states. And here on the right, uh, we show the, the bounds from searches from Ygret and, and Fermilat for different uh, light scalar masses. Again, the green region is the, is the preferred one. But we also have um, a strong self-interaction from the first term in the Lagrangian, which will strongly bound our model. So in this case, to, to show that there is a viable uh, parameter space, we assume that actually this phi, this scalar dark matter, it's only uh, a pers uh, it's, uh, it's 20, it's around 20% of the total density of dark matter. Uh, so actually, I'm done. Just the conclusion is that the xenon one ton excess can be explained by non-relativistic dark matter that interacts through Rayleigh operators. Direct detection, given some better prediction, can already probe the parameter space of, of, this, uh, of this model and uh, uh, of this uh, dark matter and light pseudoscalers. Pseudoscalers or real scales mediators are actually viable models. Viable models. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michele, for the nice talk. And uh, I see a question from uh, Xiaoping Wang, please. So it, it's very nice talk. So I have a question that since you have a very large coupling or, and uh, light A as a mediator, do you have constraints from uh, dark matter self uh, scattering cross section? Yeah, that's, that's why we have, if you see on the right, uh, upright of uh, slide, uh, slide six, we have to assume that in order to avoid this self-interaction bounds, ah. one has to assume that phi cannot be the entirety of the dark matter. If that okay, the thank you. density is around 20%. Okay, are there any other questions? So it seems not, uh, we, then we thank Again, uh, <clears throat> Michele, and we move to the next speaker. Hello. Okay. Very good. So, um, Joseph Pladler is the next speaker, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here. So the, the talk will be on uh, new, con new limits on dark photons from solar emission in KV scale dark matter. And this is work done in collaboration with Hai Peng An from Tsinghua, Maxim Pospelov from Minnesota and Adam Ritz from Victoria. Um, okay, so... Um, so, oops, sorry. So, since I'm going to talk about uh, dark photons, uh, I just want to point out that, um, and also on uh, solar generated fluxes of dark photons, I just want to say that uh, uh, most of this physics has been settled in 2013 and 2014 in a series of papers, in a series of papers where we uh, discussed the, the emission and the absorption processes, uh, specifically in li liquid xenon as well. Uh, so what's new since then, um, among the biggest qualitative changes are that kappa is now called epsilon and that MV is now called MA prime. Um, only 50% of that I consider progress. Um, but of course, the uh, most significant progress um, is uh, on the experimental side, uh, namely the, the impressive increase in experimental uh, sensitivity. So the now... now uh, the, the background rates of, of, of these uh, ton scale experiments are on the order of tens uh, per ton and year. Um, so, 
I should also say that the, the, the prevalent use of kappa and NMD uh, in these slides uh, just tells you that many of these slides are part of the historical record and uh, in the end I have some, some, some uh, new things. Okay, so I just would like to start um, highlighting the, the, the physics of, uh, of dark photons a little bit and the most important aspect uh, uh, with dark photons is that they mix with the photon and that mixing is uh, is medium dependent. Um, the, an easier way to see this is um, consider, for example, the um, the Lagrangian, uh, the kinetically mixed Lagrangian, and consider the the uh, Angel emission of a dark photon called V here. Then uh, use equation of motions, and then you have this manifest mixing between the photon and the dark photon here with, with this kappa and B squared um, uh, coefficient. So any matrix element you write down with the emission of a dark photon would be of the form kappa mv squared times the matrix element of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic current uh, times the photon propagator here and times the polarization vector. And so if you plug in the, um, the photon propagator, you get this prefactor here and b squared minus uh, the self energy of transverse and longitudinally polarized uh, um, photons. And so, in, in essence, uh, you can uh, uh, describe then this matrix element uh, by the electromagnetic current uh, talking to the dark photon with, a, with, a, uh, with an effective kinetic mixing parameter. And of course, uh, this analytic structure uh, suggests to you immediately that uh, uh, there's the possibility of, of a resonant emission of these dark photons in the, in, in the sun. So, whenever this uh, denominator here uh, uh, goes to zero, and then depending if it's a transverse or longitudinal mode, um, uh, we we hit a certain resonance condition. So for a, for a transverse emission, the the resonance is hit when uh, the vector mass equals the, the plasma frequency of the medium. Uh, and then basically, you can cut the diagram and f forget wherever this uh, uh, this uh, transverse plasma came from. Uh, it transits into a dark photon here, and um, this was a process uh, that uh, has been calculated long ago by Javier, and uh, in 2013 uh, we clarified uh, uh, the importance of the longitudinal resonance in this uh, process, where the resonance condition is actually that the energy of the dark photon matches the plasma frequency. So for transverse emission, you basically uh, have resonance at a very specific stellar radius uh, where this condition is met, whereas uh, longitudinal resonant emission happens anywhere throughout the star as long as it's uh, kinematically allowed. So here's an example of a, of a solar dark photon flux uh, for, for one, uh, one EV mass uh, and this uh, dashed line shows you now the longitudinal spectrum and so here this, um, this resonant region basically stops at uh, 300 electron volts so that's uh, essentially the plasma frequency uh, at the center of the sun. Um, so beyond that, you only produce uh, these dark photons through, uh, through um, uh, Bramstrahlung. And once you're above 10 EV, uh, this is uh, above the atomic ionization threshold of xenon. And so this is, uh, uh, then you can pick it up with these experiments. Now, moving to the absorption side, uh, again, we have the same diagram. We can, we can or a similar diagram, we can again write the, the amplitude for, uh, for absorbing a dark photon. Um, same structure here. Again, we have the matrix element of the electromagnetic current. Um, and so if we square that, we get the rate. And now this matrix element has to be, again, evaluated inside the medium. And uh, this integral is nothing else. Um, then the imaginary part turns out to be nothing else than imaginary part of the self-energy of the photon uh, in liquid xenon, for example. And so um, the total rate is proportional to the imaginary part of this pi TL, and it's nothing else than the optical theorem, really. Um, and so we used this language back in 2013 and 14, and these days the literature is basically full of papers uh, computing these uh, this uh, self energy functions for all, all all sorts of materials from 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 superconductors to dirac materials and so on and so forth so many people are already familiar now with this so here's the update um, on the solar dark photons uh, in gray uh, you see the 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 astrophysical bound uh, where um, where excess emission would basically be basically be in conflict with observed uh, 
uh, boronate fluxes uh, from the sun, um, the, the solid blue line is the old ten on 10 result. And with uh, and using the last year uh, S2 only analysis from xenon one ton, uh, we get this new red line here. Uh, it might not look very much, um, but you should consider this improvement of a factor of a few. Um, it goes with, uh, with the coupling epsilon to the fourth power because you have to emit the particle and then you have to absorb it. So a factor of few is actually a an, an, uh, considerable increase in sensitivity. Uh, These dashed lines here um, then relate to the case where the origin of the dark photon mass is not uh, Stuckelberg. Um, but its origin is actually from, from a Higgs mechanism. Then you have additional interactions of the dark photon with the Higgs, and so you get additional um, emission processes of dark photons and these light dark Higgses that do not decouple with, uh, with MV here, and so you basically uh, resemble uh, constraints uh, that would also look like this uh, for milli charged particles, for example. And here, the, um, the astrophysical limits are uh, still significantly stronger than the uh, than the direct uh, limits. So about two minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can take um, more if you need. Okay. So uh, just very briefly, uh, I want to say to, to to put this to put this update into perspective, um, we were not the only ones to to constrain uh, solar fluxes here. Uh, there was a paper in 2015 where um, the authors basically threw everything they had. Um, uh, into a global analysis, global statistical analysis, so using uh, surface helium abundance, convective radius, solar sound speed profile, neutrino fluxes as observables, and then basically they constrain um, the dark photon flux to be um, at, a, at about uh, a 0 0.02 um, of, of the solar luminosity. And so our previous criterion was here, now their criterion is over there, and so now we can look what does it apply for, what does a new team in one ton result apply? And that's basically constrained on that level. So you see now um, direct detection has really overtaking, uh, has really overtaking astrophysics uh, in, in that respect. And it's probably, will be probably be difficult uh, to, to, to turn this around and, and put uh, even tighter astrophysical constraints here. Um, very briefly, just at the end, um, um, this was also mentioned by other uh, speakers in the morning that um, you can you can have an explanation of the excess of the xenon one ton excess by having dark photon dark matter around two to three kV being absorbed. So this gives a, a monochromatic line in the detector, which is then smeared out. Um, and I can show you here. Uh, this is the spectrum that you get. So here you have the line. If you smear it out, uh, you get a nice uh, fit to the excess. Um, for solar dark photons in the astrophysical allowed region, uh, we do not find uh, any good fit. And basically the reason is that the solar dark photons are just too soft. Uh, and so you tend to overshoot the first bin uh, while not being able to, to fill the, the next two bins. Um, you can fit the axis with, uh, with uh, solar dark photons as well, uh, but only if you, if you go I mean, into the KV mass region. Um, then uh, you have this spectrum here. Once it's folded with experimental, uh, with experimental details, uh, you get this line and you would get a nice excess, but then you're uh, vastly uh, in conflict with, uh, with uh, stellar cooling constraints. And so this is not a viable explanation of this axis. So I stop here. Um, thanks very much. Uh, there, are other, um, there are comments on other possibilities in our paper. So Maxime poured in some of his wisdom and I uh, just uh, refer you to Maxime's talk on, on other possibilities here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Josef, for the very nice talk. And um, I see um, a question uh, in the chat from Andreas uh, Trautner. So Andreas, you can either speak or I can read the question as you wish. He, he cannot speak, so you have to read that. Ah, okay, so I will read the, the question of Andreas. Uh, all right, right. Hi, Joseph. Uh, how dependent is uh, your limit for the Higgs case on the details of the Higgs sector, and in particular the assumption MH about MZ prime? Uh, does the effect decouple for 
and mix much larger than uh, MZ prime. Thanks. Uh, yes, so that, that's of course true. So, so if you make the, the dark Higgs uh, heavier than your sort of uh, kinematic, oops, then you, oops, then you kinematically forbid um, uh, this, this, this pair emission here. And, uh, and so then, then, then the limits will go, I mean, these limits will be uh, relaxed. So here what we took is basically that MV equals MH prime. And so this is uh, the kind of uh, natural case to consider. But yes, if you, if you split it, it will be dependent, dependent on this. All right, so are there other questions? It seems not. So we thank again, Josef, and we Thanks. move to the next speaker. So next speaker is Aaron Vincent. Can you hear us? Yeah, just give me yeah. a second. Sure. Great, yeah, sure. Here we go. Uh, should I? Can yes, please. You can start, Aaron. Thanks. Do you see my screen there? Yes. It's good. All right. Uh, it says it's paused, but if you can see it, then it's good. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about this uh, new paper that came out with um, Celine Bohm, uh, David Sardinio, Malcolm Fairbairn, and Pedro Machado. And if you think this title slide is inappropriate for a Xenon talk, um, you could attribute it to um, Canadian politics. So what I'm really going to do, I'll do a little bit of history as in uh, the previous talk, and then move towards how this is now updated in light of the new um, constraints. Um, so you should see my second slide by now. Um, no, we so, cannot see it. It's okay. frozen. Yeah, it looks like Zoom is being a bit too clever for its own good. Uh, let me just try one more time. Otherwise, I'll I'll just show you my um, slides directly. All right, here we go. Um, so normally, to see this the solar neutrino fluxes, we because of the small neutrino nucleus cross, uh, cross section or neutrino electron cross section, we need to go to very, very big detectors. So for example, you know, Borexino, Snow Plus, Super K, these are all 100 to 1,000 ton detectors. Um, and this is necessary even though the solar neutrino flux is you know, something like 10 to the 12 particles per square centimeter per second. Um, but what we're thinking of here is, well, what about instead of going to larger detectors, we go more sensitive? Right, and this is what direct detection experiments have been doing, uh, has, have been getting really, really good at for the past um, few decades, right? Um, so meanwhile, right, in the, in the dark matter world, we're improving on all of these uh, limits on neutrino nucleus uh, scattering. And I'll get to a neutrino electron scattering in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, sorry, on dark matter nucleus scattering. Um, but we have this big, scary neutrino flow here that we're going to run into that's going to be this uh, irreducible background to the detection of dark matter in these experiments. And this, is, this uh, occurs through coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering, sometimes produced, uh, sometimes pronounced sevens because nu and v look alike. Uh, and this was actually first observed in the last couple of years by coherent, not from solar neutrinos, but from uh, beam neutrino source at the SNS, I believe. Um, but if dark matter direct detection experiments can start to see neutrinos, that means that they can start to do physics with these neutrinos. And in particular, this is, this is made possible because of the very, very low backgrounds that are required for these experiments, and also the very, very low thresholds. So if we're talking about uh, neutrino nucleus scattering, that is, you know, nuclear recoils on the order of keV or even less than a keV. And if you want to probe the lowest energy um, solar neutrinos, so the PP flux of which, which is the most abundant, you also need to, to go to electron recoils um, that are quite low. So this is uh, what we talked about in this paper from uh, 2016. And, and it's effectively a statement that solar neutrinos are going to be a major background that can be interpreted as a signal in these future neutrino experiments. 
So if you look at, so these G, uh, G2, that's generation two, uh, germanium, silicon, and xenon. So xenon is really what we're thinking about here when we're talking about like something like xenon one ton or n ton. Uh, this would be a super CDMS that maybe hasn't lost um, most of its mass due to funding uh, issues. Uh, and over here, we have these future xenon experiments, or future argon, that's your Darwin and your Argo. Uh, future neon, that's a bit of a fantasy to, to go to lower thresholds. But the takeaway from this table is that these rates start to look very, very high. And when rates are high, you can start to do some interesting physics. So the first thing you can actually do is some standard model physics, right? You can look for, say, a better measurement, a more precise measurement of the boron-8 neutrino flux, more precise measurement of the PP flux. This is with electron scattering because it, we're, we're able to go to very, very low thresholds. Or even because the, dark, the um, neutrino nucleus and neutrino electron scatter, uh, scattering depend differently on uh, the weak angle, depending on uh, the, the isotope that you're using, you can also use this as an independent measurement or an independent constraint on, on the weak angle at very, very low energies. It's something that beam experiments just can't do. Um, and you can also do interesting uh, solar physics as well. There's this well-known well discrepancy between the observed abundances of the sun and the helioseismological observables that you see. And one of the possible ways of uh, deciding between these models is measuring the metallicity in the center of the sun. And you can do that if you're able to measure the CNO flux really, really well. So we're not here to talk about standard model physics. We're here to talk about new physics. So the observation here is that the momentum that you're exchanging as a neutrino, drawn here by Malcolm, uh, interacts with um, an electron, you know, is something around 10 keV. And the momentum exchange for a, nuclei, a neutrino nucleon event could be, you know, MeV scales. But these momentum scales are pretty much unstudied because they're much lower than most Earth-based um, experiments can reach. So this gives us an opportunity to measure new interactions between neutrinos and electrons. So the ones that we're going to focus on here are something like, so I have some new vector mediator, some I'll, I'll call it a Z prime, but you can call it an A prime if you want, or a V, um, or some new scalar that allows for the interaction between neutrinos and electrons. Right, so these are very, very straightforward. Some of the most straightforward diagrams you can uh, calculate, you get um, a nice cross section. One thing to note with the uh, vector is that you do get an, um, an exchange, you get, you, you get an interference with the um, uh, Z exchange in the standard model because all the final states are the same, the initial and final states are the same. So this is um, sort of the lay of the land, what it looked like uh, when we wrote this first paper four years ago. So it's, it's very messy, but let me just very quickly summarize what's going on. So we have constraints, existing constraints from super CDMS and LUX. These are dark matter direct detection experiments. These are for couplings to nuclei. For couplings with electrons, we're actually down here in the dotted uh, region. So uh, existing con constraints on couplings with electrons are this, super, this CDMS light line. And these are for those future experiments that don't quite exist yet. Now, you have a lot of other constraints. So in gray, these are constraints on uh, a new coupling. So the example here is a gauge G, G, B minus L coupling, but for just for the sake of understanding what's going on, the gray ones uh, apply to couplings to um, electrons, but not necessarily to nucleons. Um, but the thing I wanna point out here is that the strongest lab-based constraints so far between, so below an MEV, if you, if you don't think about these fifth force uh, constraints for now, these are up here, right? And everything below that relies on astrophysics to some degree or another. So what happens when we add the xenon one ton data? Well, we have our neutrino uh, Z prime electron interaction. And so this is the space of the mediator mass, the mass of the Z prime and the square root of this coupling times this coupling, because they all, they, they come in together. And you get a region here at masses below say 50 or so um, keV that is preferred over the background by 
two sigma almost, but not quite three sigma uh, down here. And in yellow, what I think is, is also really, really interesting and really important to highlight is the region that's now excluded by xenon one ton. And so we've gone, our dark matter direct detection experiment is actually surpassed this bound by Gemma and Borexino in setting the laboratory constraint on neutrino electron, a uh, new neutrino electron mediator. Uh, this is the same plot. For, thank you. This is the same uh, plot, but for a scalar mediator. So a little bit less exciting since we're already in the region that's ruled out by earth based constraints. But you can do the same exercise. And because of the nature of this talk, I need to, to show you a best fit. So this is what you wind up with. Um, here we're letting the background vary uh, and the efficiency vary within the errors that are quoted by the experiment. And this is the fit that you wind up with, with a, uh, a new scalar mediator in orange, new vector mediator in blue. And this is the, so the, the best fit that we reproduce from the, the xenon paper with a, just a magnetic dipole, a neutrino um, magnetic dipole. So just to summarize the takeaway here, dark matter direct detection experiments are now large enough and sensitive enough that we can probe new physics in the neutrino sector. And I think this is a really, really cool observation. Um, if you want to explain the xenon one ton signal, you can introduce a new light mediator, 30 to 50 keV or so. Um, you need to get around those astrophysical bounds though. Um, but regardless of all this, if this turns out to be tritium, if it turns out to be a cosim miracle, or uh, you know, an axion, something else. Um, regardless of all that, that will mean that Xeon will have set even stronger limits on these new interactions, these secret interactions between neutrinos and electrons. Um, so I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the, this nice talk. And there's time for questions. So I don't see. I can just point out that there is a little hole here in this parameter space um, where the uh, solar bounds on, the, on a Z prime won't quite apply because your Z prime isn't making it out of the sun. Mm -hmm. do, do you have also bounds from other stellar systems? Uh, so there's the globular cluster bounds here. This plot's a bit of a mess, supernova, um, 1987A is here, uh, but we didn't go into too much detail on the astrophysical side. So that there is a hole. It's. Uh... I think there's a hole. Yeah. Okay. Does somebody knows uh, where does it come from? The hole. Oh, this is just that the the so the sun instead of cooling will reabsorb your Z prime because the coupling is too large. Ah, okay, like um, a trapping. Uh, right. The gym. For the, okay. Okay, very good. So, uh, don't see any questions. So, uh, we thank um, uh, Aaron for the nice and general talk. And uh, so, I think we have been uh, quite uh, in time, not too bad. And we have uh, some final uh, uh, concluding remarks from uh, Maxim Pospolo. And uh, that will uh, close the session. So, Maxim, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Uh, okay. So, please. shall I try to share my screen? Uh, yes, please. So. Okay, very good. So, I leave you the stage. Uh, file view screen, probably like this. Can you see my, see my slides? Yes. Very well, uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's a, a really nice uh, seminar series and I'm going to summarize uh, uh, the topic even though I heard only a fraction of talks. Uh, so uh, as we know, there were recent results that generated some excitement and uh, about 40 theoretical papers by many authors and I will just acknowledge them by the by the number 
everyone is supposed to remember the number of the uh, the, the, the HEPA identifier that, uh, that uh, they, they attached it to. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there are several new ideas that uh, that's been uh, discussed, and uh, I'm going to review uh, not not very um, eg exhaustively some of these things. Well, I'd like to start for, with with uh, with. Uh, uh, 2015 paper with a projection uh, that uh, uh, Xenon uh, uh, collaboration has given for the, the uh, electronic recoil background. And if you uh, see here is uh, per kilograms per day. So if you take this number and multiply it by three times 10 to the five to get to the ton yield, you see that you would uh, that this black curve gets uh, very, very close to this red one. Uh, so the, in other words, the collaboration has delivered on what it's promised, and this is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite an achievement. Well, at the same time, there, are, there is an excess at a few lower bends, and uh, uh, since the collaboration itself has given some sort of uh, itself some liberty on uh, interpreting this excess as a, a signal of new physics, uh, there, there is, of course, uh, uh, an understandable theoretical excitement about this. Um, Mind you that this is not the only excess that uh, Xenon collaboration has. So in particular, they have the analysis that goes to the uh, uh, lower recoil energies uh, at uh, sort of a, a cost of sacrificing half of their signal, S1, so-called. And then uh, in the lowest bands, there are, there, are, there are also excesses, but it's not even known very well where they come from and it is maybe not uh, not necessarily likely that this uh, originates in the volume or uh, of the detector or from some physical uh, recoil so the, the collaboration itself does not uh, dramatize that excess even though this much 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 larger and it, uh, apparently it feels much more comfortable with with the excess at uh, at uh, in the two to four kV energy bands. So, so this is maybe a, sorry, I interrupt you because there's a question. Maybe is interesting for everyone. So Yuri asks, what is a kVe in physical uh, kilo electron volt? Uh, so here, here, this is uh, uh, the uh, e, e is equivalent of the elec uh, 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 electron equivalent. Right. So if you take a nucleus and kick it with with uh, uh, with uh, uh, a certain energy, right? It's only a fraction of that energy goes to into kVEE. So here it's an excess that refers to uh, one or two or three uh, uh, ionized electrons, basically, because the 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 uh, x axis is uh, for the electrons, and uh, they have quite a number of these events. Very well, uh, so um, um, among the possible explanations, the collaboration itself puts uh, forward uh, such things as uh, low Q value beta emitters, uh, tritium in particular. And uh, we all know that uh, some uh, e-capture elements, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, potassium could, uh, could generate uh, uh, also uh, energy deposition uh, in, in uh, 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 range. We of course don't uh, expect any uh, banana peels floating inside a xenon uh, tank, but the uh, banana flavor would do it. Anyways, uh, uh, this is uh, of course uh, not uh, not to us. There is to to analyze what uh, what it could be. Who who knows, right? So the collaboration itself will. Uh, Keep an eye on that, as well as on uh, the time stability or time variability of the uh, excess, because the, this this excess, for example, has, has time variability. That's uh, 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 and and uh, the, I'd like to know more about it. And as we know, many sources of putative signals, such as things that come from the solar core, do not vary. 
All right, so what if it is a sign of new physics? Uh, uh, I think the most exciting possibility is that uh, we see some sort of a thermal KV scale emission from the sun, right? Uh, the, and that's, that's, I believe, is the reason why the collaboration kind of um, did not, you know, take it out to this possibility from uh, the table right away. Um, is it a sign of non-trivial interactions of other standard model particles such as uh, neutrinos? Is it a sign of new KV energy scale built into the dark matter physics such as mass or mass splitting? Or is it a sign of new fast particles, dark radiation, boosted dark matter? What are the possible sources? So this, these are the, the ideas that are being uh, discussed a lot in the literature. But just first of all, I'd like to say that uh, uh, we don't have a direct probe of uh, thermal emission from, uh, from, uh, from the core of the sun that has a temperature of roughly 1.3 kiloelectric volts. Uh, we have, of course, uh, probed it through, uh, through solar neutrinos that are indirectly sensitive to that temperature. But, but if there are light particles such as axions, they can be emitted and absorbed in the experiment. And uh, this is, of course, a super exciting possibility. The uh, a problem with interpreting the excess that way is that uh, there is uh, um, uh, basically the couplings that, uh, that, uh, that you need uh, are uh, sort of order three uh, larger than, than, than the bounds, right? And remember that the signal, like suppose the bounds are solid then, uh, then uh, this three enters uh, uh, to the fourth power. So you need uh, really like uh, another, a factor of 100 in sensitivity of the experiment to compete with the bounds, if the bounds are solid. Uh, so uh, it, the uh, uh, plain sort of uh, axion uh, model does not seem, or axion-like particle model does not seem to fit the excess uh, because of the other stellar constraints. But uh, maybe it's time to revisit some calculations, and in particular, in the last week or so, uh, the inverse Primakov on the, on the xenon side was added, which is a uh, uh, welcome, uh, welcome addition to the literature. Now, uh, there are other light particles uh, other than uh, uh, axions that can be emitted, uh, dark photons, for example, as you heard from Joseph's talk, but uh, Joseph's talk, but then. Uh, the spectrum appears uh, to be too soft if you take uh, the uh, um, um, the allowed parameter space. So the, the the question I have is: there any models of sub KV dark sectors that could give an excess and a weight out of bounds? So uh, the thing that I'd like to look at at, at this point is maybe some models where you have a, a more dark, dark sector particle. For example, an axion can be emitted due to the Primakov effect, but its coupling of an axion to the dark photon can be much, much larger. So you can, uh, an axion, sorry, of a two axion-like particle of, a, of a, a, say, 4 keV mass. Uh, and then it can decay to the uh, two dark photons that uh, later can be absorbed. It, there is no theorem that this is uh, going to be excluded. And in particular, uh, I, I think that there could be some part of the parameter space that is not excluded in this uh, a slightly more complicated model. The advantage of these models is that the KV scale kind of, uh, uh, of uh, of the sun uh, is, uh, is a defining energy scale. Uh, uh, then uh, there, there are some uh, sort of uh, uh, really more uh, 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 non-trivial ideas uh, associated that maybe some of the stellar constraints could be relaxed because uh, mass and the coupling change as a function of environment. So sometimes this particle is called chameleons. And uh, uh, it, it can happen that the mass uh, or a coupling is, uh, is uh, renormalized somehow in some very non-trivial way inside the, inside the dense medium and you don't, you, don't get, uh, you don't get exclusions, right? Or they're, they're getting milder. 
So this, uh, for me, the, this uh, has a strong sense of déjà vu uh, because this is being discussed with so-called, uh, in connection with so-called evil as anomaly uh, 15 years ago. So this, uh, this, this is an old, uh, old, uh, old idea. Uh, so in other words, I, I'm interested to know if any models of sub-KV dark sectors uh, could give an excess and evade uh, other stellar bounds. Now, uh, 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 the uh, sun is a strong emitter of neutrinos, which is clear here. I heard from Aaron. Uh, the the uh, PV flux provides uh, up, up, uh, almost 10 to the 11th uh, per centimeter squared per second neutrinos with sub energy. energy. Uh, if such particles would have a magnetic moment on EM, uh, then uh, uh, that is dimension five operator. Then, then uh, interaction with photon. This would give uh, 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 a decent feed to the excess uh, as collaboration itself notices. But it it faces such explanation faces challenging bounds from the uh, plasma and decays to pairs of such particles. So uh, light new Z primes, for example, if you, if you add the new Z prime, maybe in the KV scale, and uh, uh, it, it will have certain universality-like uh, features uh, scattering on electrons. So it will have a reservoir uh, scattering if the momentum transfer is larger than the mass squared. So it will, have, it will go as D E recoil over E recoil squared. And as they can, uh, this the shape can be fit well with the KV uh, uh, scale particles. But uh, I would say uh, uh, maybe I missed something, but it, it does smell to me like a very non-trivial cosmology that needs to be reinvented as well as uh, uh, stellar production. Even the particles are reabsorbed, uh, they can also contribute to, uh, to abnormal heat transport and so on. So I'm not. I'm not entirely sure that there are, there are uh, uh, blind spots there. Uh, so maybe more complicated uh, neutrino sector with a BSM sort of sterile component. If there are a few MEV particles that could be emitted in, uh, say, uh, uh, as a byproduct of a boron flux or the Earth uh, neutrinos, and they have a magnetic moment. That could possibly fit the excess as well. But it, uh, I don't know if it's been investigated. Now, uh, going over to uh, more exotic possibilities, maybe it's dark matter, right? After all, the whole experiment was built to search for dark matter. So KV scale can be built into the dark matter. To begin with, the dark matter could be of a KV scale, or a few KV scale, and then, um, for example, dark photons of that uh, of that nature, or axion-like particles that couple to electron uh, coupling uh, mass. Uh, sorry, electron axial vector coupling, uh, uh, or any other vectors coupled to electron spin y dimension five operators. They could all fit the excess rather well, and because these are such numerous particles that have uh, really relatively large concentrations, huge fluxes. Uh, they can be, uh, we can go to couplings really exceedingly tiny and uh, be, like below 10 to minus 15 in this case. And that can, uh, can be, by, well, first of all, I find it by itself super interesting. And uh, second, it, it's not directly challenged by, by uh, stellar energy losses. So this, uh, this is an interesting possibility. Another possibility which is uh, as flexible or maybe even more flexible is you have a, sub, a substructure to heavier dark matter. Uh, uh, so if you uh, say I have a dark matter of uh, say a GV mass and you have uh, some uh, matter, uh, you know, uh, several components to it with the splitting in the order of a few KV, you can have a de excitation in a detector where the electron takes uh, this, uh, this recoil and, uh, and uh, that would fit the excess well. You can get uh, this X2 primordially because they could be sitting all the way from the, from the Big Bang or they can be uh, excited in the prior collisions. 
And uh, the, the advantage of that scenario is that you can go to a GV scale mass with a dark matter and await uh, astrophysical bounds or immediate astrophysical and cosmology bounds. So the problems with all these scenarios, of course, is the uh, sort of uh, ad hoc tool KV scale built in by hand if we want to use it as, uh, as an explanation. And that's, uh, 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 that if you account for low uh, loop elsewhere effect, that's, this would be immediately end up in being low. Fast dark particles. All right, so recoil electrons, if you just translate uh, a few kV to, uh, to a recoil velocity, it tells you that this is uh, sub-relativistic velocities, but far greater than the velocity of a typical dark matter that you would imagine sitting around the halo. So therefore, it is kind of suggestive, very suggestive, that uh, the recoil came from the collision with a faster particle than a particle that moves with a velocity over C at 10 minus three. Uh, uh, so uh, this, uh, where does the, the, the fast particle could come from? Uh, well, there was a number of ideas explored even prior to this excess, because they, they, if you take solar electrons in the middle of the sun, right? Uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, they have same similar energies, so the they solar electrons move with that, uh, with that velocity. So if you come in with, uh, with a mass uh, particle, that, a mass that is comparable to electron mass, which is a challenge from cosmology point of view, then uh, you would get uh, a velocity, a recoil velocity in that range. You can get it in that range. So, uh, uh, there they can be collisions with uh, other fast particles such as cosmic rays or uh, there could be non-trivial processes in the dark sector as well, such as uh, annihilation to a dark radiation states or semi-annihilation where you get uh, a, a semi-relativistic dark particle or even decays, simple decays of existing particles such as dark matter and, and other particles. So. Uh, the, here I put some estimates for the reflected flux or the cosmic ray, uh, uh, dark matter accelerated from the cosmic ray flux. Uh, this is very, very small numbers, but still there are some papers claiming that the, the excess can be fit with that. Um, so some years ago, uh, uh, Janu Lukui, uh, Josef Radler and I were looking at the decays of the uh, dark matter. So if you have a dark matter sitting uh, with a mass of one GV, and it has a lifetime exceeding the lifetime of the universe by say a factor of 10, which it must, uh, uh, then uh, the maximum fluxes that you can get uh, uh, that are composed out of the local dark matter decays and the global decays are in the 10 to the four per centimeter squared per second. So if now the particle uh, is endowed by some interact the daughter particles are endowed by some interaction with a star model, for example, the magnetic moment. So that, that could uh, very uh, probably fit the electron uh, excess and then, uh, uh, sorry, the xenon excess and uh, the, the, the magnetic moments on the scale of one per sort of 10 to the five GV, that, that, that might, might not be a problem. But, uh, if the particles are truly fast, one should be also uh, uh, be concerned that they, they also create uh, recoils in, uh, in uh, uh, neutrino detectors where the, the, there is even greater sensitivity to, to, uh, to recoiling electrons, say, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with recoil momenta, of, uh, with recoil energies of, say, 20 MeV. There is, uh, uh, exceeding the strong limits from supernova. So uh, you, one can even address very exotic possibilities that maybe particles around us decay, right? Uh, aside of normal radioactivity, maybe protons decay. If they decay to something they're interacting, you can ask the question whether that could feed the signal. And the answer is probably no, because the, the, the uh, normalizing of them, the, the proton lifetime uh, proton has to live exceedingly long time, right? 
but there is a lot of broadens around. That's that's the mitigating factor. You get to the end of I say it's per centimeter squared per second, and that does not seem to be enough to to uh, pr furnish a signal, even if uh, I sort of try to maximize somehow the decay product interactions with uh, electrons. If on the other hand, there is a sort of a, a finely crafted model so that were discussed in connection with neutron uh, lifetime anomalies where the masses of daughter products are very close to the say masses of electron and proton within an MEB then the hydrogen itself can be unstable, but the proton can be stable, and then uh, the maximum fluxes can be then much larger because the constraints on the lifetime of a hydrogen are far, far more relaxed. So this is uh, the paper just uh, appeared today by us with Dave McKinn and uh, Neil Mulgaj, and uh, forgive me talking about so, so then uh, if daughter particles are interacting, you can also have uh, very easily KV or high mass or energy deposition. Uh, so what I like to see is at some point uh, exp exploring sort of the universal features of, of such decays. If you, if you uh, decay into military particle or a particle with a magnetic moment, there could be very little memory in the signal of what, what the mass of the sort of uh, passing particle is, right? And uh, or what the energy is, and that, that would mitigate model. So I, I think my time is up. Uh, uh, it's been an interesting two, three weeks uh, to, to sort of uh, see people rekindle their love to, uh, to electron recoil in dark matter experiments. And uh, there's been, uh, a very uh, large number of sensible ideas expressed. Uh, um, and first of all, we should uh, congratulate Xenon collaboration on really delivering their sensitivity to, to the, to the uh, sort of uh, projected sensitivity and more. Uh, and uh, this is an unprecedented, uh, the clean experiment. And we're looking to see uh, more results. Um, uh, strong limits, regardless of the excess, can be imposed on many scenarios, uh, both from the data that came out this year and from the last year data that uses on the S2 signal. Uh, uh, and the excess is tantalizing, but it's not yet amounting to evidence for new physics for obvious reasons. Now, connection to thermal KV scale emission from the sun is probably, for me at least, uh, the most exciting possibility. Axions and uh, the simplest variants of axions and dark photons do not seem to be able to fit the excess while escaping other constraints. Can uh, more complicated dark sectors uh, be at play? That's, uh, that's still, still a, 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 a topic that, uh, that deserves a, a few extra weeks. Now, uh, KV scale physics uh, can be an intrinsic structure or substructure of the dark matter, right? The KV scale dark photons can be hanging around uh, or, or alps uh, from, from the inflationary time. For example, with uh, couplings as small as 10 to minus 15 or lower and can still uh, provide an interesting uh, uh, signal. But uh, or the same goes about the mass splitting, uh, split dark matter. And uh, unfortunately, there is an extra input, this KV scale built uh, build in by hand. And uh, what's uh, well, at the end, I was trying to say that uh, uh, fast particles, right? You could be, if it's relativistic, you would call it fast, uh, fast uh, like dark radiation, or it could be. Uh, sort of semi-relativistic dark ma darkish matter particles uh, could also be a, a good source of it, right? You always expect some of that flux to exist in the first place uh, because not all dark matter moves with the velocity of 10 to minus 3. But uh, uh, sort of uh, this, this scenario is, of course, also prone to a variety of sort of unknown unknowns. What, what, how do you get it? What, what the interaction of daughter particles is? And so on. And uh, I'd like to see maybe more uh, uh, investigations of 
universal kind of interactions, the interactions that would be less sensitive to the uh, energies of the projectiles, such as uh, newly charged particles or particles with magnetic moments uh, that uh, would have some degree of universality uh, that would uh, uh, mitigate model dependence uh, and possibly provide a fit for the experts. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Maxim, for this nice uh, overview of um, all the models and ideas uh, so far. And we have a bunch of questions. Uh, first, Yuri, please. Hi, Maxim. Thanks a lot for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, like you said, that in, um, in the dark matter cases, the KV scale has to be built in by hand. And, uh, well, I was arguing that if you connect it to the production mechanism, then you could kind of reduce or avoid the look elsewhere effect. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, there could be many things. Uh, it could be production or uh, that if you have a very, very natural model of production and you say, well, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, that, that comes out, uh, uh, the KV scale comes out naturally and that's, that's it, right? But yes, there are, there are other, other uh, um, sort of priors one could use, right? There's one is on this, on this plot, right? So here is, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, it is known that uh, uh, stars uh, maybe cool a little, a little uh, faster than, than needed and the KV scale particles can, or KV or lighter particles could provide that provide uh, provide uh, such a such a uh, uh, such a fit right um, then uh, there could be some some um, other uh, possibilities uh, 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 yeah so I, I agree if there is uh, right with, with this uh, split dark matter there there are there were sort of arguments that uh, they could be uh, signal for 3.5 kV, uh, you know, lines uh, that can be fit as well the, together, right? So if you, if there are more priors, uh, then yes, yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, next question from uh, Jure. Okay, so I basically have a comment because you mentioned the low energy. Um, um, excess in photoelectrons for xenon. There is another one that dark, dark side sees. So dark side 50 is also a, an, um, an anomalous, um, large number of anomalous events at their threshold. It's in the nuclear recoil analysis, so it's hard to convert what this means for the electrons, but it's in the nuclear recoil, it's below one kV. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So who so knows what this converts to? We, we have many anomalies in uh, the um, um, dark uh, matter, right? Starting with one famous experiment in Italy, right? Uh, sure. No, but it, in this case, it would be interesting if these two match. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. I have no. Uh, I've not known about the dark side uh, anomaly, so I don't, uh, um, I, I probably should have a book, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> other questions. So there's Andreas Strautner that writes in the chat. I think Borexino uh, also has that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Borexino has, uh, what exactly? Uh, I think it was, uh, cannot see a KV scale deposition, right? Because of the carbon 14 background. Okay. Barexino threshold starts at 200 KV and goes up. So it's another region in any case. Yeah, it's a, yeah. So th this is, this is why, by the way, the reason why, why uh, we can't have a, uh, very efficient uh, carbon-based dark matter detectors, right? Is this scintillation, but uh, okay, there is carbon-14 you can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so Yuri just uh, put the link in the chat about the dark side anomaly. Great, thank you. So just a comment, uh, you mentioned at some point the PVLAS deja vu, uh, previous slides. So, uh, of course, there it, it was much easier because uh, you had the uh, experiment at uh, zero temperature and uh, now it looks much more difficult to, to apply these oh. ideas. No, wait, wait, uh, no. Uh, can I answer this? Like now the, the, what Xenon wants from the axion like couplings is maybe a factor of a few, maybe three and five or so away from the, from the coupling constraints from, from the stars, right? What PLS wanted from the axion like couplings uh, was, I forgot, three or four is of magnitude above what stars allow, right? So there, if you embark on uh, explanation, you would really have to say nothing in the stars goes as we think right, with these particles. They definitely change their, 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 their properties. So it's very unusual particles. Here, you know, you can say, well, well, maybe the red, but this like federal collaboration tries to dance around this topic saying, oh, maybe there is like stellar uncertainties not taken into account correctly. I, I don't think so, by the way, but, but uh, yeah, so PVLAS was way out, right? And this is, this success has a more sort of statue uh, than PVLAS anomalies just because this is a, a, um, um, a very, you know, uh, developed program here, very much established collaboration, published results, right, as, a, as opposed to PVLAS thing that exists mostly in folks. So, so it's, uh, uh, that's, that's why uh, there is a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a more, more, more serious attention. Being paid. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, so I don't see any other questions. So at this point, I thank all the speakers this morning and this afternoon for staying in time and uh, everyone that participated to this nice uh, uh, overview on the Xenon Access.